uh, hey, from uh, on. Tech University. Hang on just one second, Jim. Let me get the recording started and we'll oh, start, okay. start that over. All right. And we're recording, so you can uh, you can introduce uh, Jeff at will, and then I'll go ahead after Jeff gets started. Once you introduce Jeff and everybody, and Jeff gets started with his presentation, I'll go ahead and mute everybody so that um, we don't accidentally interrupt him. And then uh, if we need to unmute, let me know, Jeff, and we'll do that. Oh yeah, you, well, right. you can you can interrupt me anytime. I like a free flowing conversation rather well, than then, me talking at you. So well, then I'll let everybody <laughs> I'll let everybody um, uh, self govern on the muting mm -hmm. and um, muting and unmuting, and we'll just take it from there. And uh, Jim, you're on, and then we'll go from there. Thanks. Okay. Our keynote speaker tonight is Dr. Jeff Robertson of Arkansas Tech University. I believe he's talking about space debris. Space debris, yeah. Let's see, I'll share my screen and then we'll uh, see if that works. There we go, how's that? Yeah. Okay. Wicked. So all about space debris and how to observe, enjoy it. I'm not sure we're all enjoying it, but space debris is uh, basically also known as space junk, space pollution, space waste, uh, space trash, space garbage, or just one other thing that humans have trashed. It's defunct human-made objects in space, principally in a low earth orbit which no longer serve a useful function. Uh, this includes derelict spacecraft, non-functional spacecraft, abandoned launch vehicle stages, mission-related debris, including tools. Yeah, there's an astronaut's glove floating out there. Um, very numerous in orbit. There's even fragmentation debris from the breakup of derelict rocket bodies and spacecraft. There's derelict human objects left in orbit. There's even fragments from disintegration, erosion, collisions, paint flecks, solidified liquids, solidified liquids expelled from spacecraft, unburnt particles from solid rocket motors. Space, degree, space debris represents a, a pretty big risk to spacecraft that's growing quite rapidly. And I think that's probably what inspired uh, the picture here with, uh, this is a picture from gravity, right? <laughs> Uh, I, I found some real life news articles too. Uh, the quest to conquer Earth's space junk problem from nature. Um, zombie satellites and rocket shards and collisions are creating major traffic risks in orbit. Researchers are working to reduce the threats posed by more than 20,000 objects in space. Um, to give you a few examples, here is a, a picture of a, uh, a puncture in the Hubble Space Telescope antenna dish. So when they went up to service at one time, they went, oh, wow, something whacked the, the Hubble Space Telescope. And then here's a picture of uh, the windshield from um, STS-7, the, the space shuttle, uh, a big window pit. So something smacked the space shuttle. Pretty scary, especially if you're one of the astronauts on the mission and you get back and, <laughs> hey, wow, check that out. Um, U.S. Space Command uh, is in charge of, uh, I guess, monitoring all the orbital debris and tracking it. Uh, it's the, the 18th Space Control Squadron uh, uh, at Vandenberg uh, Air Force Base it is uh, developing meaningful uh, data for monitoring of this stuff as it grows in size. Most of the objects now orbiting the Earth are uh, just pieces of debris. Only about 3,200 of the 25,000 objects tracked by US Space Command are active satellites. So 3,200 3, out of 25,000 things that they're tracking. Uh, all users of the space catalog published on uh, www.spacetrack.org will have access to the data. I was kind of curious about the website, so I logged in, or I just brought up the website, and lo and behold, there's the Chinese uh, uh, rocket body uh, that's going to be plunging back into the Earth, and they've got a prediction for the latitude and longitude, but that longitude and latitude will likely change depending on 
exactly when it re-enters. There's a window of an hour of uncertainty. And uh, so I thought that was kind of interesting. And of course, the king of space junk, I guess, uh, you guys were talking about him too, e Elon Musk and uh, SpaceX. And uh, I think for a while, Jim's Facebook page had the, uh, maybe it still does, the uh, uh, Tesla Roadster. Let's see if I can turn on this video here. Uh, So that's, uh, the Starlink satellites are pretty cool because uh, usually when you're looking at satellites, and I'll go more into this when we talk about how to observe them, you just see one. Uh, but for the first time ever, a few weeks ago, I saw a set of Starlink satellites. It was a group of about eight or 10 of them all in a line traveling along. And I said, oh, that must be the Starlink satellites. It was the coolest thing ever. I'd never seen them like that. So uh, they're probably responsible for the increase in UFO sightings. Uh, I'm, I'm certain of that just because they look so they're just so different from observing regular satellite space junk in space so there's a lot of traffic in orbit these days um, this is sort of a plot showing the accumulation of space junk starting with uh, Sputnik in the space age and coming up to present time and you can see sort of this uh, pretty rapid exponential growth here at the very end um, but space junk is sort of uh, accumulating pretty quickly in the near-Earth orbit. Uh, another graph of the same thing. Um, kind of see the total number of objects, fragmentation debris, spacecraft, mission-related debris, and rocket bodies. Uh, the significant jump that you see here in 2007 uh, was due to uh, the the Chinese again, uh, they were trying to destroy an old outdated weather satellite and they, they said, well, let's blow it up with a missile. So they did. Well, what they did was they just created more, more debris. And so that's, that's what this jump is here in 2007. So word to the wise, maybe we shouldn't uh, try to blow things up in uh, low earth orbit. So in 1995, NASA was the first space agency in the world to issue a comprehensive set of orbital debris mitigation guidelines. And two years later, the US government developed a set of orbital debris mitigation standard practices based on NASA guidelines. And I think you guys were talking about what, why didn't the Chinese have some way to guide the rocket down it? I don't know, maybe they haven't adap adapted these guidelines yet because uh, other countries and organizations, including Japan, France, Russia, and the European Space Agency all followed suit with their own orbital debris mitigation guidelines. So uh, there are, uh, a set of space agencies of 10 countries that have adopted a consensus of guidelines to help mitigate the growth of the debris in our low earth orbit. Here's some more uh, headlines. This one's related to the, uh, of course, the Chinese uh, rocket, the giant piece of space junk hurtling towards earth and is sort of the inspiration for my presentation tonight. Uh, what you see here is just the, uh, headlines and then uh, what's funny is a picture of a comet so <laughs> but then over here it's got a, a plot of the altitude this uh, rocket canister uh, had a pretty elliptical orbit and it's at its uh, closest approach it was rubbing the earth's atmosphere so uh, it created drag with the earth's upper atmosphere and it's been decaying ever since in sort of a non-linear fashion as it uh, rubs the atmosphere and 
the Earth's atmosphere actually expands and contracts uh, in response to the solar wind. And so low Earth orbiting satellites, especially if they get really low and have elliptical orbits, uh, are quite unpredictable in how they how the friction drags them down. And that's why it's been a real chore to try and figure out where this thing's going to land. They know it's going to land between plus 41 and minus 41 degrees latitude. Just the timing, they have no idea what longitude that's going to be at. This is a, a satellite map, and if I can, I'll bring up this website that shows 19,244 satellites currently tracked uh, around the Earth. And you can zoom in and look at all of them, see where they all are. And, you know, this just looks like a swarm of bees to me. So I'm like, my God, if I was going up in the space shuttle, I'd be like, I don't know if I want to go up there. <laughs> but of course, you know, the scale of the Earth is so vast on this scale, it makes it seem like that you can't even get through this cloud of debris. It's, they're spaced out much further than that, of course. But this is a kind of a cool website to go play with and uh, check things out. I don't know if you can click on that and it'll tell you, yeah, it'll tell you where it's moving and show you its path. <laughs> even tell you what it is <clears throat> give you some data on all of them so you can kind of look at where satellites are in real time so uh, I, I i lost about an hour today playing with this thing because i just thought it was the coolest thing ever <clears throat> and then you can see this ring of uh, i believe these are the geosynchronous satellites way out here but the ones that are gonna be troublesome for the uh, space station and the astronauts are kind of in this range <clears throat> Europe is uh, launching a suicide robot to try and hug space trash out of orbit. And uh, I think they have a, uh, a video of, uh, I got a video of another, another, um, another type of uh, spacecraft that was being tested. This one's gonna sort of go up and these arms are gonna grab this thing. And then this thing's gonna deorbit and burn up as a suicide robot. So they're both gonna decay and burn up in the atmosphere. So it's gonna go up and retrieve defunct satellites and uh, splash down. So for every satellite you send up, you can take one down. <clears throat> uh, this other thing, let's see if I can get it up. So, in another experiment to test techniques to clear up space junk, the removed debris satellite uh, has demonstrated a harpoon hit in orbit. Uh, so it fired the projectile and hit a target board at the distance of an, a boom. And um, so their idea is, is they're going to design ways to, instead of go up and grab it like this uh, suicide robot, they're going to launch a harpoon into it and um, grab it and then probably uh, deorbit. So go send some Robin Hood robots up into the space. So those are some really cool missions, uh, one being developed and one that is uh, past the uh, developed stage. Now, in addition to the really cool website with the 19,000 objects, there's a much simpler one for the much brighter objects, one that you might look at when you're aboard or when you maybe have a public night and you wanna see where things are in space, let's see if I can, oops, let me zoom out here on, let me go to the real website. Here we go. So in real time, this tracks uh, oh, 90 to 100 satellites. And earlier tonight, I saw, I saw HST and ISS somewhere on here. Let's see if I can zoom out. Well, I guess that was 20 or 30 minutes ago. They're probably, anyway, it shows you where things are located in the sky for several different objects. I'm gonna show you a, a very useful resource for like, say if you have a public night, I always do this every time I run a public night is I will get on this website called heavensabove.com and you put in your location. You can change your observing location by clicking anywhere on the earth. And then if you go down to daily predictions for brighter satellites, 
you will it will generate a table and you can go down to fifth magnitude you can limit it to third magnitude you can pick the date and um, it will give you a table of all the satellites that are passing overhead that evening and then before twilight in the morning that that morning and i will usually print this out because inevitably when you're standing there looking at the planets or the moon or whatever somebody will see a satellite and go hey look there's a satellite and then you know oftentimes they'll be oh i wonder what that is and you go well would you really like to know what it is well i'll tell you what it is and you just look up the time that it is and sort of where it is in the sky and you can get a good rough estimate of which rocket it is um, oftentimes I will print out at least two, say the really, really bright ones, because I know those are going to be ones, the bright ones that are really high in the sky. So this first column that has this magnitude that's really bright. And if it's also really high in the sky, 39 degrees is not all that great, but let's uh, maybe 3.5 and 70 degrees. So that's going to be way overhead. This is going to be a good one that probably people could see pretty well. I would click on that and print out the next thing which is basically a sky chart of where it's traveling in the sky and what time. And uh, so if you don't wanna serendipitously have someone say, hey, look at this satellite, you can say, well, hey, about um, 8.33, why don't you guys look towards the Big Dipper and tell me if you see a satellite running from uh, north to south. And uh, you can tell them a few minutes ahead of time and they'll uh, warn the group if, if they see it. And you can tell them, well, that was the, uh, lacrosse rocket or whatever the cosmos 841 rocket it's an empty rocket canister uh, when you click on that information let's see down at the bottom you scroll down in addition to the little chart of the sky it'll tell you some things about you know when it rises when it sets when it enters the shadow its distance its brightness stuff like that so i find this tool very very fun to utilize with public groups on a night when you have an observing night I just print out this table right here and take it with me and maybe print out one of the night sky charts. And then if you notice, I think um, if you go far enough, well, that's for the evening somehow. Oh yeah, this is uh, right after sunset. You can click on this button and it will give you uh, things that are coming up right, right before sunrise. So you can see the time change here. So these are all the things that are up right at sunrise. <clears throat> Has anybody ever used Heavens Above or something like it before? Most people these days probably are more apt to just grab something on their iPhone. There's a bunch of different uh, satellite trackers for the iPhone and the Android and stuff like that. Um, my favorite one is Satellite Tracker because I also have the Starwalk app and Satellite Tracker by Starwalk is a pretty good one. Uh, and it does the a very similar thing to what Heavens Above does. Allows you to sort of figure out when the satellites are coming by. And, and one of the, in addition to the Starlink satellites, which are an annoying and bothersome, but also kind of interesting, uh, the space station and the Hubble Space Telescope are really cool to see traveling across the sky during a public night. I mean, they're as bright as Jupiter running across the sky. And when you can uh, use this predictor tool to tell you when it's gonna be around uh, and then tell everybody to look for it in the Southeast or whatever, and it comes screaming across, takes a couple minutes to go across the sky. It's really kind of a gas to say, think, hey, there's the space station or there's the Hubble Space Telescope. And, uh, at least try to enjoy some of the space junk that humans have put into space. Occasionally, if you're observing with the uh, with your telescopes and things, you might catch uh, a man-made object. And this is a sequence of images from the RRT at our uh, club site. Uh, I was imaging asteroids and interested in minor planets and stuff. So the little asteroid is running across up here in these images. But you'll notice in the second frame here, there's a man-made satellite that runs across and creates a streak. And so every once in a while, you'll see it capture a satellite in some of your astronomical images or some of your uh, images. And uh, occasionally, if you have the dates and the times of, and the location, 
uh, of this streak. And you could go back and utilize one of these things to figure out, well, what was that that passed by? What was that piece of junk that I caught in my uh, image frame? And if you can't find it in uh, this list, then you know that it was the aliens that came to visit. You could say, hey, there's proof. I didn't find it in the list, so it must have been. So it's kind of fun to do that, take some observations. If you are really into uh, radio astronomy, I found this website here that uh, you can do satellite tracking uh, with uh, satellites. And uh, this amateur club in the UK has some uh, free mobile satellite tracking apps for the iPhone and Windows and Android. And uh, the club actually shows you how to create one of these little devices to uh, listen to the satellite and track it. So I thought, wow, that it, that takes a lot of, I mean, that's a, that's like battle bots for satellite nerds, right? It's way cool. Um, I thought, well, I want to try that. I want to build one of these things. Um, so if you're interested in that, I, I've got the website here for that. Uh, because that seemed like something fun that I know absolutely zero about, but it looked like, whoa, that's that's cool. <laughs> and uh, if you uh, are real interested, NASA has a complete uh, organization, the Orbital Debris Program Office, where all things orbital debris are located, which I thought was fascinating. Debris measurements, debris modeling, debris protection, debris mitigation, debris remediation, debris reentry, and all things related to uh, debris in space and keeping astronauts safe. So I thought that was um, pretty, pretty much a gas. And I had no idea that things were accelerating like they were. I mean, I, I, I've been following, you know, Starlink and, and I saw the movie Gravity, but I didn't realize how uh, far we'd come in terms of putting more junk in orbit and how this sort of uh, sort of gone nonlinear started to increase. And I think people are starting to be aware that maybe we need to like figure out ways to, to not just leave junk up there to figure out more efficient ways to put stuff in space and then deorbit it or get rid of it or keep things from doing collisions. Cause I think at some point there's a tipping point and uh, it, it would be a bad, it would be a bad day. Um, so with that, I think I'll pause and uh, open the floor up to questions because that's always fun and interesting too. Well, can everybody hear me? I don't know if yes. this mic works. Okay. You bet. Um, I've used a program. I don't know. It might be a Windows program only, but it's called SatTrack. Yes. And, um, it was free for a while and they they sold it to another guy and he charges i think it's like 10 bucks to get it now but um you take your computer plug it into the handset on your uh celestron guided uh telescope or i think it works on meads also and uh if you plug in the satellite you want to look at and you can just through your eyepiece you just follow the satellite across the sky and uh Rocket bodies are kind of fun to look at because they're sitting there tumbling sometimes. So they're sitting there flashing as they go across the sky. And um, if you're real ambitious, you can hook up uh, your scope to track uh, the space telescope, uh, the Hubble, if you catch it low enough, or you can get the, um, the ISS and um, track that and I, I found I had to use a 40 millimeter lens on it because it's you have to be real precise on getting it but it's a uh, that's just a fun way to spend half an evening if you run <laughs> yeah. out of other things to do what one of the one of the things that's really fun to track uh, and watch for is satellites that are tumbling and you can see them get fainter and brighter uh, as they go across the sky. And the most intense of these are called iridium flares, these satellites that have uh, solar panels and reflect sunlight really brightly. They can increase in magnitude 10, 100 times over the course of just a few seconds. And uh, they call them iridium flares, but basically what it is is you're at an angle where those solar panels hit the sun and direct it right down to your location. And they're really a gas to watch and see as well. I, I noticed that, uh... Um, heavens above doesn't 
doesn't show iridium flares anymore, does it? Um, good question. Um, go back to menu. Oh, uh, let's see. Uh, go backwards one, like back, 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 way back. That right here. I think they. Oh, they used to be here, didn't they? Yeah. I was going to ask about the same thing. I had not noticed that. Yeah, iridium flares used to be one of these things you could click on. So that's very interesting. Because Carl always told us when they were going to be at a star party. <laughs> uh, <laughs> yeah. Huh. Well, you're decommissioning a lot of those things and replacing them with stuff that doesn't flash. So, oh, well, I'll be so are, they, um, are they taking them out of the sky? Or how, how are they... Oh, they're just leaving them up there. It looks like they'd still be flashing then. They should be, but uh, I guess they just gave up on tracking them. Maybe they retracted the uh, solar panels or something. That's interesting. Huh. Oh, I may investigate that because that is, that is know, rather I odd. Any, I hadn't seen any in a long time. Yeah. So, so Jeff, uh, go, uh, go ahead, Michael. I was going to ask, are there any of these retrieval systems that will collect more than one object because it seems like it's a rather expensive way to oh, clean up debris. Yeah. Oh, I By thought so one too. one satellite bring down another satellite, you know, you just spent all that money for the rocket. Go up there and probably the rocket stage is up there. Yeah, I was going to say, there's two rocket stages and a, and a satellite just to remove a satellite. I thought that's very interesting, but I, yeah, I don't know. I yeah, think the rocket stages, most rocket stages have a, a thing where they burst. Yeah. And they will then come down through the atmosphere. And burn up, yeah. And burn up. It's just a matter of I think they're testing it's technology. It's not. It's not practical. They're. they're Seems doing... like one of the one of the original Star Treks had a garbage scowl up in space. Well, I, I, the, 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 one of the first things I saw a few years ago from NASA was they'd send up a robot that was sort of like the retrieval robot, except it was a robot that would latch on and and, and stick a little booster on it, and they'd get it pointed the right direction, and they'd give it a little bump and send it down to where it would decay, and then he would go on to the next one. That seemed like, yeah, more reasonable to me. Uh, yeah, so you could you remove more. But I think the, the practicality of enough fuel to go from satellite to satellite to satellite uh, is probably uh, prohibitive at the moment until they can get some technology to, you know, it takes a lot of energy to change orbit. Uh, yeah. And so it's hard to sweep up more than one or two objects. So when you so when you image asteroids like you were doing, uh, mm -hmm. how I guess that was like a one frame, right? Image, it was just one frame accidentally. So every twenty might, seconds or something. Yeah, twenty or thirty seconds, and it traveled across. Uh, if you're interested in, um, you, you can utilize the the telescope to track asteroids. Um, if you uh, there's two ways to do that. Uh, am I still sharing my screen? Yes. Okay. So spaceweather.com is a, is a real fun uh, website as well for uh, various things. But at the very bottom of space weather, they have a list of uh, near-Earth asteroids that are passing by. And oftentimes, I'll use this list to try to see if there's something that I might be able to capture with the RRT. Uh, and what I'll do is I'll use this to generate a table of the coordinates of where it's going to be, say, like at, I don't know, 9 o'clock. And I'll schedule the RRT just to point at a star in that location and take about 20 minutes of images and then wait for the asteroid to pass through the field. And uh, you can do, I guess you could do the same thing with a, a, a satellite. You could just point the RRT at a point in space where you know the satellite's going to pass. Just pretend you're going to observe a star in that location and wait for the satellite to pass. And you ought to capture it. Uh, and that's one easy way to... Uh, rather than try to get the RRT to track uh, in a non-stellar uh, uh, direction, is just to point it at a location where you know it's going to be for about five or ten minutes and just take a few images and let the satellite or the asteroid pass by. And that's how I, I do the asteroids. But when you look at this list, uh, you find something that is of interest. And if you click on it, it's going to take you to a JPL website. And uh, once you go there, um, it sort of shows you this object and what it is, but uh, that's not what I wanted to show you. Let's see here. If you click on this ephemeris thing, 
it brings up this table and you can change your location. Um, I, I put in the location of the astronomical observatory. You can change the dates and do things like that. But when you generate the ephemeris, it'll give you a listing of the date and where the object is in right ascension and declination and its magnitude for whatever amount of times that you put at the beginning. And so if we go back to the top here, you can change the time span. This is stepping across one month in one day intervals. Um, you can change that to be every five minutes, or you can change that to be over the course of a year or whatever. But I, I will sort of use it to, to look for an asteroid that's probably, I need something in less than 17th magnitude or less than 18th magnitude or something, or brighter than that. Uh, but let, let's say we found one that was um, pretty bright. Uh, I don't know if, how I might guess, but uh, find a big one here, a diameter that's really huge. Maybe this guy's really big. <clears throat> Yeah, there's one that's 17th. I might have been able to get it with a few. So you, if you find out, well, let's see, it was brightest on May 11th. So let's say, let's say it's, uh, yeah, it's going to be in three days. So of course it's at minus 45 decks. So that wouldn't work. But let's say it did work. And you said, all right, well, that night I want to like take some images where it's going to be. This is probably too uh, granular. So I'd go back to the top and I'd change these dates to center around, uh, what was it, the 11th? Yeah. Just do that and step size every, uh, every couple of hours <laughs> and regenerate the ephemeris. And now I have where it's gonna be every couple of hours on the, those one or two nights. And so I could program the RRT. Let's say I just said, well, uh, here it talks about astronomical twilight, the moon's up, the sun's up, stuff like that. But if you decided, okay, here's here's the night and time I kind of want to do, well, you just program the telescope to look at a star at this location for a few minutes on either side of this time, and you would capture the asteroid crossing the field of view uh, with that list. And you might want to go more granular than every couple hours. You might you might do it every four minutes centered around four o'clock for 20, 30 minutes to get a real nice uh, set of coordinates to tell the RRT to go look. Hey, and Jeff. We, yep. I'm not sure if you're aware, but if you pull the uh, ephemeris from the Minor Planet Center, schedule, yep. Scheduler can take that as direct input. And oh, can it? And it I, yeah, did, I it, did not know that. Yeah, it'll schedule those observations for you. Very cool. <laughs> <laughs> So did, um, uh, along the lines of what you were talking about, Jeff, did, did everyone see uh, Jake Winfield's uh, capture um, on the Facebook members page? I've got it queued up if, if, uh, if you'd like to see it, haven't seen oh, it. Oh yeah, all. sure. For the ISS, yeah, that was brilliant. Yeah, that, that, was, not, that was not a trivial, um, trivial thing to do. Let me see if I can get this shared out. Okay should be should be showing up on, uh, on a screen it, near you it's showing up okay so this is the actual footage that he 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 did a couple of things he captured a, essentially a video and then took the video to build a still image um this is the, the so he stacked he basically stacked and added and that's my understanding cool. so i'll go yes. ahead and play this and let it loop through um the details on this, I believe he was using a C11, um, Celestron C11. I'm not sure what. That was uh, correct. I'm I accused sure. him of having his mother hold a model on a string in front of the telescope because <laughs> he often goes observings with his mom. She's really cool, too. I don't know if you guys have ever met her, but she's sometimes, you know, they're out there at the uh, RRO with, I'm with them and she's fun to talk with. And she's actually pretty knowledgeable in astronomy, but I think she was holding it on a string. That's what I'm thinking. So that's the footage looping through, and I'll see if I can get it to the still image that he that, captured. That's just that. amazing. So there's the still image, and and if um, I think he put a note up here, I'm gonna have to move some things around on my screen. It says on the far right, you can see the SpaceX Dragon capsule attached to the ISS. <laughs> so 
an Arkansas view of um, the ISS. That was uh, that was impressive. Jake did a great job. Yeah. And how clever to think of doing that. Well, that's my show. Thanks for your attention and we had a good time. Any more questions about something cool, interesting? Well, just one comment. Uh, I, I don't know if anybody is aware of it, but the Astronomical League has uh, got a certificate and a pin for Earth orbiting satellite observations. So uh, check that out and, and you can observe from satellites and, and get a, a certificate for it. So I'm going to query Danny a little bit. So uh, I, I'm real familiar with the Minor Planet Center uh, thing. Uh, what is it that you get from them that then feeds into the uh, the scheduler? Is it so, a data file of some sort? Yeah, you can go to the uh, NEO plan observation planning page or the yep. information page. And if you set the if you set the uh, ephemeris generator to use decimal yep. coordinates. And geocentric for the location. Okay. Then you can take and paste, generate it for hourly ephemeris. And then you can take like every other hour and paste that directly into the scheduler web form. I'll be darn. And it will take those and it will do a Lagrange interpolation on it and predict the location and just schedule the observation for you. It's pretty cool. All right. Well, I'm going to try that next. <laughs> what about the tracking part? That's the part that Jake never answered to me. So, for example, I have a standard German equatorial. My sidereal drive goes east-west. I can make some slow motion movements north-south. But can you change, like on, on a C-11 or any of these other go-to scopes, can you make it track the satellite or in, in case of what Jake did, the ISS? Yes, I believe that's what Alan was uh, referencing earlier with the software where these go-to scopes can actually take instructional moves from the software to, uh, to, to track the, um, the orbital path of the, the uh, ast well, not just, I'm sorry, it wouldn't be an asteroid. It would be a, if it's an asteroid, <laughs> we'd be in trouble if it was moving that fast, but the uh, space debris, yeah. And if you're if you don't have that much technology, I, I honestly with the way you got these uh, video capture and the stacking, you can simply get once you get on the satellite, you, you can do some nudging and let it run across uh, the field of view, and then nudge it and let it run across the field of view because you're going to be capturing and stacking images anyway. Yeah, if you use that sat track uh, program I had mentioned. Um, you need uh, real precise uh, location uh, and time off a of GPS, but uh, once you got that, you could actually track ISS all the way across. And uh, the hardest problem you got is getting the image to hit whatever chip you're using in your camera. I've just I've had uh, small chips um, on the cameras I've used, and it was impossible for me to hit it, but it you know, a real large chip, you might might have success. So, so Alan, can, can you do that to any go-to scope? You just program it in and say, here's the here's the orbit, track, track it? Yeah, you just, uh, you just uh, select whatever satellite or, IS, or for example, ISS. Um, you pick it up when it's uh, over in the, huh. over on the Western horizon, you tell it to move your scope over there and tell it to start tracking. And uh, it'll it'll just directly move to the location and start following across the sky. It's it's okay. a fun program to mess with. That's very interesting. I believe if you use something like Stellarium and uh, and uh, set it up to drive your scope, you could do that as well. Yeah, Stellarium, uh, the sky, and other programs like that will drive non sidereal rates. To track. Okay. Uh, there, this is Harvey. There was a friend of mine. We went on a trip to Wichita, and he he's an amateur radio guy, 
And he said, hey, let's go look at this satellite up here. So he got his iPhone app out. And he said, there's going to be one up there, you know, there it is. And he, so, but the reason why they're interested in it is because they can bounce signals off of it and talk to people on the other side of the earth just for that short period of time, you know? Ah. Yeah, ham radio stuff. Is that what yeah. he's doing? Yeah, he's a yeah. What a, he's a ham radio. Yeah, I forgot the word. Yeah, I, ham, I, I yeah. was a ham operator when I was in high school. I, I never thought about that, but I guess you could. Yeah. Yeah, some are up for an hour or two, or good part of an hour, and some are just up for a few minutes yeah. before they make their pass. I used to try to remember angling things so we could skip off the atmosphere to extend our thing, but never hitting a satellite. Really interesting. Uh, the, uh, the amateur radio club I'm in right now has a project going where they're bouncing signals off of the moon to the other side of the earth, or not a, quite the other side, but oh. very, far, very far around the globe. They need bigger antennas, though. Yeah, bigger I was going to say, what's your signal just uh, uh, loss? Well, you need a big antenna and, and, and a lot of wattage. Yeah, I was going to say. I heard there's somewhere, somebody near Hot Springs has a dish that's like an old military dish or something <laughs> so if the moon's in the right spot or your feed points in the right spot you can make make a baby arecibo <laughs> wow something to think about for when the weather's cloudy for a month or two at a time yeah well you, we always need our little nerdy things to do to keep ourselves happy stellophane's going this year i got an email saying oh. people can register for it now. That sounds like one of the cool get-togethers. I don't know how they're going to run it because it can get pretty crowded. Uh, no. I know um, Ed Swaim has been to Cellophane at least once, maybe more than once. And uh, he's given presentations on it mm -hmm. on his trip out there. That um, He's our resident Cellophane expert. He's not oh. jumping in. So, Ed, do you think they can it, run it, it safely? It took, me, took me a while to unmute. Yeah, I think they can run it safely. Um, it's a big camp out, so people are spread over a 40-acre site, approximately, where the most people are most of the time. Then the Pink Clubhouse is on a smaller site. And, you know, people have learned to stay far enough apart that um, – they shouldn't have any problems at all. There's, they're not going to use any of the small indoor facilities, and their main presentation building is a huge metal building. Uh, it's really a sort of like a shed that you park eighteen wheelers in, with sides on it. So uh, there's plenty of airflow, and people in Vermont are, if you look at their numbers, they're careful folks. And a lot of the uh, attendees are. The whole northeast so i think you know they'll be coming in from a good wide area but i think that once they get there they can handle it pretty well i'm not too keen on going up there because i don't really want to cram in on an airplane even though i'm vaccinated but uh uh flight cost and rental car costs have gone up quite a bit recently for this summer so that that may keep me from going so has lumber. Mm. Yeah. Not a good time to build a telescope, I guess. It, add, it would add an extra 30 bucks. <laughs> well, I'm gonna go, I'm gonna go ahead and stop the recording at this point and then you know we can we can continue to chat and, uh, and uh, until we want to jump off of here. Thank you all. Enjoy. Thanks. Thank you. I love you all. Can't wait till we be together in person. Well, we are in person in 3D, not 2D. A Amen. <laughs> <laughs>